Chapter 72 A Fitting Epitaph After their victory at Urubain, the months passed both quickly and slowly for Aragon. Quickly, because there was much for him and Saphira to do, and rare was the day that they were not exhausted by sundown. Slowly, because he continued to feel a lack of purpose, despite the many tasks Queen Nasueta gave them, and it seemed to him as if they were idling in a patch of becalmed water, waiting for something, anything, to push them back into the main current. He and Saphira stayed in Urubain for another four days after Nasueta was chosen queen, helping establish the Varden's presence there and throughout the surrounding area. Much of that time they spent dealing with the inhabitants of the city, usually placating crowds who were furious with some action of the Vardens, and hunting groups of soldiers who had fled Urubain and were preying upon travelers, peasants, and nearby estates to support themselves. He and Saphira also participated in the effort to rebuild the city's massive front gate, and at Nasueta's behest, he cast several spells designed to prevent those still loyal to Galbatorix from working against her. The spells applied only to the people within the city and the adjacent lands, but having them in place made everyone in the Varden feel safer. Aragon noticed that the Varden, the dwarves, and even the elves treated him and Saphira differently than they had before Galbatorix's death. They were more respectful and deferential, especially the humans, and they regarded him and Saphira with what he slowly came to understand was a sense of awe. He enjoyed it at first. Saphira did not seem to care one way or another, but it began to bother him when he realized that many of the dwarves and humans were so eager to please him, they would tell him whatever they thought he wanted to hear and not the actual truth. The discovery unsettled him. He felt unable to trust anyone other than Rorin, Arya, Nasueta, Oric, Horst, and of course, Saphira. He saw little of Arya during those days. The few times they met, she seemed withdrawn, which he recognized was her way of dealing with her grief. They never had a chance to talk in private, and the only condolences he was able to offer were brief and awkward. He thought she appreciated them, but it was hard to tell. As for Nasueta, she seemed to regain much of her former drive, spirit, and energy after a single night's sleep, which amazed Aragon. His opinion of her increased tremendously, upon hearing her account of her ordeal in the Hall of the Soothsayer, as did his regard for Murtag, of whom Nasueta spoke not a word thereafter. She complimented Aragon on his leadership of the Varden in her absence, although he protested that he had been gone most of that time, and thanked him for rescuing her as quickly as he had, for, as she admitted late in their conversation, Galbatorix had nearly succeeded in breaking her. On the third day, Nasueta was coronated in a great square near the center of the city, in full view of a vast crowd of humans, dwarves, elves, werecats, and ergles. The explosion that had ended Galbatorix's life had destroyed the ancient crown of the Broadrings, so the dwarves had forged a new crown from gold found in the city and from jewels the elves had taken from their helms or from the pommels of their swords. The ceremony was simple, but all the more effective for it. Nasueta approached on foot from the direction of the ruined citadel. She wore a dress of royal purple, cut short at the elbows so that all might see the scars that lined her forearms, with a train fringed with mink, which Elva carried, for Aragon had heeded Murtag's warning and insisted that the girl stay as close to Nasueta as possible. A slow drumbeat sounded as Nasueta walked up to the dice that had been erected in the center of the square. At the top of the dice, next to the carved chair that would serve as her throne, stood Aragon, with Saphira close behind. In front of the raised platform were the king's Oric, Orin, and Grimmer, along with Arya, Dalthar, and Nargarsvag. Nasueta ascended the dice, then knelt before Aragon and Saphira. A dwarf of Oric's clan presented Aragon with the newly made crown, which he placed upon Nasueta's head. Then Saphira arched her neck, and with her snout, touched Nasueta upon the brow, and both she and Aragon said, Rise now is queen, Nasueta, daughter of Ajahad and Adara. A fanfare of trumpets rang forth, and the gathered crowd, which had been deathly silent, began to cheer. It was a strange cacophony, while with the bellows of Urgles intermingled with the melodious voices of the elves. Then Nasueta sat upon the throne. King Orin came before her and swore his allegiance, followed by Arya, King Oric, Grimmer Hafpa, and Nargarsvag, who each pledged the friendship of their respective races. The event affected Aragon strongly. He found himself holding back tears as he gazed at Nasueta sitting regnant on her throne. Only with her coronation did it feel as if the specter of Galbatorix's oppression had begun to recede. Afterward, they feasted, 
and the Varden and their allies celebrated throughout the night and into the next day. Aragon remembered little of the festivities, save the dancing of the elves, the pounding of the dwarves' drums, and the four coal who climbed a tower along the city wall, and there stood blowing horns made from the skulls of their fathers. The people of the city joined in the celebrations as well, and among them, Aragon saw relief and jubilation that Galbatorix was no longer king. And underlying their emotions, and those of everyone present, was an awareness of the importance of the moment, for they knew they were witnessing the end of one age and the beginning of another. Upon the fifth day, when the gate was nearly rebuilt and the city seemed reasonably secure, Nasueda ordered Aragon and Sephira to fly to Drasleona, and thence to Bellatona, Fenster, and Aros, and in each place to use the name of the ancient language to release from their oaths everyone who had sworn fealty to Galatorix. She also asked Aragon to bind the soldiers and nobles with spells, even as he had bound the people of Urubain, to keep them from trying to undermine the newly established peace. That, Aragon had refused, for he felt it was too similar to how Galbatorix had controlled those who served him. In Urubain, the risk of hidden killers or other loyalists was great enough that Aragon had been willing to do as she wished, but not elsewhere. To his relief, Nasueda agreed with him after some consideration. He and Sephira took with them over half the Eldunari from Vrongard. The rest remained behind with the heart of hearts that had been rescued from Galbatorix's treasure room. Blodgarm and his spellcasters, who were no longer bound to defend Aragon and Sephira, moved those Eldunari to a castle several miles northeast of Arubain, where it would be easy to protect the hearts against any who might seek to steal them, and where the thoughts of the mad dragons would not affect the minds of any but their caretakers. Only once Aragon and Sephira were satisfied that the Eldunari were safe did they depart. When they arrived at Drasleona, Aragon was astounded by the number of spells he found woven throughout the city, as well as in the dark tower of stone, Helgrind. Many of them, he guessed, were hundreds of years old, if not older, forgotten enchantments from ages past. He left those that seemed harmless and removed those that did not, but oft-times it was difficult to tell, and he was reluctant to tamper with spells whose purpose he did not understand. Here, the Eldunari proved helpful. In several cases, they remembered who had cast a spell and why, or else they were able to divine its purpose from information that meant nothing to him. When it came to Hellgrind and the various holdings of the priests, who had gone into hiding as soon as news of Galbatorix's demise had reached them, Aragon did not bother trying to determine which spells were dangerous and which were not. He removed them all. He also used the name of names to search for the belt of Baloth the Wise in the ruins of the great cathedral, but without success. They stayed in Drasleona for three days. Then they proceeded to Bellatona. There, too, Aragon removed Galbatorix's enchantments, as well as at Fenster and Aros. In Fenster, someone tried to kill him with a poisoned drink. His wards protected him, but the incident angered Sephira. If I ever corner the rat coward who did this, I'll eat him alive from the toes up, she growled. On their return trip to Urubain, Aragon suggested a slight change of direction. Sephira agreed and altered her course, tilting so the horizon stood on end and the world was divided equally between the dark blue sky and the green and brown earth. It took half a day of searching, but at last Sephira found the cluster of sandstone hills, and among them, one hill in particular, a tall, sloping mound of reddish stone with a cave halfway up its side, and upon its crest, a glittering tomb of diamond. The hill looked exactly as Aragon remembered. When he gazed upon it, he felt his chest go tight. Sephira landed next to the tomb, her claws scraped against the pitted stone, chipping off flakes. With slow fingers, Aragon unbuckled his legs. Then he slid to the ground. A wave of dizziness passed through him at the smell of the warm stone, and for a moment, he felt as if he were in the past. Then he shook himself, and his mind cleared. He walked to the tomb and looked into its crystal depths, and there he saw Brahm. There he saw his father. Brahm's appearance had not changed. The diamond that encased his body protected him from the ravages of time, and his flesh showed no hint of decay. The skin of his lined face was firm, and it had a rosy tint, as if hot blood still coursed beneath the surface. At any moment, it seemed as if Brahm might open his eyes and rise to his feet, ready to continue on their unfinished journey. In a way, he had become deathless, for he no longer aged as others did, but would remain forever the same, caught in a dreamless sleep. Brahm's sword lay atop his chest and the long white pennant of his beard, with his hands folded over the hilt 
just as Aragon had placed them. By his side was his gnarled staff, carved, Aragon now realized, with dozens of glyphs from the ancient language. Tears welled in Aragon's eyes. He fell to his knees and wept quietly for a timeless while. He heard Sephir join him, felt her with his mind, and he knew that she too mourned Brahm's passing. At last, Aragon got to his feet and leaned against the edge of the tomb as he studied the shape of Brahm's face. Now that he knew what to look for, he could see the similarities between their features, blurred and obscured by age and by Brahm's beard, but still unmistakable. The angle of Brahm's cheekbones, the crease between his eyebrows, the way his upper lip curved, all those Aragon recognized. He had not inherited Brahm's hooked nose, however. His nose he had gotten from his mother. Aragon looked down, breathing heavily as his eyes again grew blurry. It's done, he said in an undertone. I did it. We did it. Gabadorix is dead, Nesueta is on the throne, and both Saphira and I are unharmed. That would please you, wouldn't it, you old fox? He laughed shortly, and wiped his eyes with the back of his wrist. What's more, there are dragon eggs in Vrongard. Eggs! The dragons aren't going to die out, and Saphira and I will be the ones to raise them. You never foresaw that, now did you? He laughed again, feeling silly and grief-stricken at the same time. What would you think of this all, I wonder? You're the same as ever, but we're not. Would you even recognize us? Of course he would, said Sephira. You are his son. She touched him with her snout. Besides, your face isn't so different that he would mistake you for someone else, even if your scent has changed. It has? You smell more like an elf now. Anyway, he would hardly think I was Shrukin or Glader, now would he? No. Aragon sniffed and pushed himself off the tomb. Brom looked so lifelike within the diamond. The sight of him inspired an idea, a wild, improbable idea that he almost dismissed, but that his emotions would not let him ignore. He thought of Umaroth and the Eldunari, of all their collected knowledge and what they had accomplished with his spell at Urubain, and a spark of desperate hope kindled within his heart. Speaking both to Sephira and Umaroth, he said, Brom had only just died when we buried him. Sephira didn't turn the stone to diamond until the following day. But he was still encased in stone, away from the air, through the night. Umroth, with your strength and your knowledge, maybe, maybe we could still heal him. Aragon shivered as if he were in the grip of a fever. I didn't know how to mend his wound before, but now, now I think I could. It would be more difficult than you can imagine, said Umroth. Yes, but you could do it, said Aragon. I've seen you and Sephira accomplish amazing things with magic. Surely this isn't beyond you. You know that we cannot use magic on command, said Sephira. And even if we succeeded, said Umroth, there is every chance that we would be unable to restore Brahm's mind to what it was. Minds are complicated things, and he might easily end up with his wits muddled or his personality altered. And then what? Would you want him to live like that? Would he? No, it is best to leave him be, Aragon, and to honor him with your thoughts and actions, as you have. You wish it were otherwise. So do all who have lost one they care about. However, it is the way of things. Brahm lives on in your memories, and if he was the man you showed us, he would be content with that. Let you be content with that as well. But... It was not Umroth who interrupted, but the oldest of the Eldenari, Valder. He surprised Aragon by speaking not in images or feelings, but in the words of the ancient language, strained and labored, as if each was foreign to him. And he said... They've not dead who they are. They are not for us. Then he spoke no more, but Aragon felt from him a great sadness and sympathy. Aragon let out a long sigh and closed his eyes for a moment. Then, in his heart, he allowed himself to release his misguided hope and again accept the fact that Brahm was gone. Ah, uh, he said to Sephira, I didn't think this would be so hard. It would be strange if it were not. He felt her warm breath ruffle the hair on the top of his head as she touched his back with the side of her muzzle. He smiled weakly and gathered up his courage to look at Brahm again. Father, he said. The word tasted strange in his mouth. He had never had cause to say it to anyone before. Then Aragon shifted his gaze to the runes he had set in the spire at the head of the tomb, which read, Here lies Brahm, who was a dragon rider, and like a father to me. May his name live on in glory. He smiled painfully, 
at how close he had come to the truth. Then he spoke in the ancient language, and he watched the diamond shimmer and flow as a new pattern of runes formed upon its surface. When he finished, the inscription had changed to, Here lies Brahm, who was a rider bonded to the dragon Sephira, son of Holcom and Nelda, beloved of Selina, father of Aragon Shadeslayer, founder of the Varden, and bane of the Forsworn. May his name live on in glory, Stygeon and Moraner. It was a less personal epitaph, but it seemed more fitting to Aragon. Then he cast several spells to protect the diamond from thieves and vandals. He continued to stand next to the tomb, reluctant to turn away and feeling as if there ought to be something more, some event or emotion or realization that would make it easier for him to say farewell to his father and thus to leave. At last he put his hand atop the cool diamond, wishing that he could reach through it to touch Brom one final time, and he said, Thank you for everything you taught me. Saphir snorted and bowed her head until her snout tapped against the hard jewel. Then Aragon turned, and with a sense of finality, he slowly climbed onto Saphir's back. He was somber for a time as Saphir took off and flew northeast toward Urubain. When the patch of sandstone hills was no more than a smudge on the horizon, he let out a long breath and looked up into the azure sky. A smile split his face. What is so amusing? asked Saphira, and she swung her tail back and forth. The scale in your snout is regrowing. Her delight was evident. Then she sniffed and said, I always knew it would. Why would it not? However, he could feel her sides vibrating against his heels as she hummed with satisfaction, and he patted her and laid his chest against her neck, feeling the warmth from her body seeping into his.